Good evening. Thank you everyone for joining me. I am Dr. Isaac Gooding, interventional pain management physician with Southeast Orthopedic Specialist, and I am going to talk to talk tonight about lower back pain management of lower back pain. Just big grand overview of how the discussion is going to go. First of all, I'll give some background on lower back pain, some basic anatomy, move on to some of the major causes of lower back pain, what you can expect from evaluation when you come and see me in terms of evaluation and workup, and then we'll get into some specific treatment options, what I can offer you in my practice. So first of all, back pain is a very common problem. Um, second leading cause of a patient seeking medical care, um, 80, over 80% 80 of adults are gonna have back pain at some point in their life. So close to everyone is gonna have back pain at some point in their life. But the, the positive um, aspect here is that most of those episodes um, will not lead to chronic pain. Less than 10% believe will lead to chronic pain. Our risk factors, whenever we talk about a uh, condition, we talk about risk factors, things that you can do to decrease your percentage or chances of developing lower back pain. Obesity is a big one. Maintaining a, a healthy weight is, is um, a good strategy to maintain. Smoking, smoking reduces blood flow, reduces uh, wound healing. It can set you up for increased pain and, and less response to some of the treatments that, that we, can, we can offer. Age, not a lot we can do about that, but as, as we get older, it can be more wear and tear on, on the lower back. Activities, whether you work in a heavy, heavy strenuous field or involved in, in athletics, and of course, trauma, motor vehicle accidents, uh, physical injuries, etc. When we talk about the timing of lower back pain, anything less than four weeks is considered an acute, it's an acute situation. This is typically mechanical back pain, disruption of normal connective tissue. And it typically, as I said, will usually resolve with conservative management. When we get over in that four to 12 week period, this is the subacute time frame, and chronic is considered anything over, over three months. And generally speaking, I, I do get a lot of acute pain in my clinic, but but typically, um, people will be in that subacute to chronic range before they before they reach my my clinic. Going over some anatomy, um, this is the the spine. We have the seven cervical vertebrae, twelve rib bearing thoracic vertebrae, and then what we're concentrating on here is the lumbar, the lumbosacral system consisting of five lumbar vertebrae and the sacrum. And when I I like to break it up into, into columns. We have the anterior column. This is the front consisting of the, the vertebral bodies, the shock absorbing cushion, the central column, and then the posterior column. These are the ridges you feel in the back, the spinous process. And this area here, we can see in the other perspective where those joints come together. This is an, an important um, anatomic feature, the facet joints, the joints. I referred to as the knuckles of the back sometimes. Looking at the, the soft tissue you see in that central column, that's where the spinal cord runs. Spinal cord ends around L2 typically and then continues on as a series of nerve roots or so the cotechino or horse's tail. Um, and the nerve roots exit out through these keyholes, the um, foramen, the neural foramen. Um, and, and you can see here that anything that can compress those nerves um, or the central canal can, can lead, to, lead to discomfort and cause back pain. Overview, there, there's lots of uh, specific causes of lower back pain, but these are the major, major categories. Myofascial pain, soft tissue injury, muscle connective tissue, the facet joints, which we just went over compression of nerve roots, um, which will lead to radiculopathy or radiculitis. The discs themselves can cause pain. And then if, if that central canal gets compressed, we can get, develop a condition called spinal stenosis. I'm gonna go over each of those in a little bit more detail, how they should present, what's, what's the uh, typical um, presentation of those. 
So with myofascial pain, this is normally an overload injury in an acute traumatic situation or stress continuous overload, those muscles and tendons have been injured. You generally present with increased tone, muscle spasm, tender taut muscle bands, sore muscles. And it's important to note that in a lot of these situations, there's, there's a lot of overlap. Myofascial pain can be its own condition, but it also can be a component in addition to another, another pain, pain source. So again, talking about the facet joints, the facet joint osteoarthritis. So you can see here, just like any other joint, elbow, knee, is facet joints have a capsule with uh, synovial fluid in between the articulating bones. And with time, as we get older, generally over the age of 40, you can, you can get arthritic changes. And that's and that's painful. Although you, you can get this in the uh, in a younger population, it's typically a result of trauma, car accident, injury, something along those lines. What's the typical pain pattern that we see with facet syndrome? What I what I typically describe it as pain along the belt line, taking along the belt line, worse with extension, tends to be a little bit worse in the morning. That's the classic presentation of, of facet pain, but you can get some referred pattern. It doesn't have to be directly over that belt line. And what we have here on the right side is some of the common uh, pain referral patterns into the groin, into the upper, upper gluteal area. Typically, typically it doesn't extend below, below, the, uh, below the knees. So the next major category is radiculopathy. Sometimes you hear that referred to as sciatica. What this is, is those segmental nerve roots being, being pinched, which causes, causes pain. You can see here on the right, um, a disc herniation, which is progressively um, getting, getting larger and causing compression of this, of this nerve root. And on the left side, you see here is an MRI. This is one of the workups that we typically do, and you can see healthy discs here and in this L5 S1 disc, you can see this large disc herniation, which is, which is pushing on a nerve root. And this patient likely has some, some radicular pain radiating in your legs. So unlike the facet joint pain, where the pain tends to be proximal, um, higher in the, in the lower, lower back, this, this typically presents radiating pain down the legs, described as burning, electric tingling. And if it gets worse, depending on the size of that compression, can lead to weakness, uh, numbness, and then, and then possibly even weakness. Depending on what particular nerve root is being compressed will determine the actual pain pattern of, of where that pain radiates. The discs themselves can also be painful. There are a series of, of nerves that innervate that disc, and it, it can present as deep, usually a deep midline aching pain, worse with standing or axial load. Um, and again, there's overlap with other with other conditions. As those as those discs in the front tend to get tend to get smaller, they may put more pressure on the facet joints in the back. You may have you may have more than one one problem going on. If that central canal gets compressed, as you can see it is here on the, on the profile view and a uh, slice through that inner space, you can see that gets, that gets compressed. You can develop um, pain from spinal stenosis. That can be from a disc herniation, from swelling of those joints, soft tissue hypertrophy, so it's ligamentum flavum, which is a ligament which runs along the uh, posterior column, and spondylolisthesis, which is slippage of one of those vertebrae, can all, can all lead to spinal stenosis. The classic presentation for spinal stenosis tends to be what's called neurogenic claudication. This is, you feel fine when you're at rest or sitting, but with walking, you develop lower back pain, which progresses to 
pain in the legs, maybe even some numbness or weakness. And then when you rest, it'll get better. This can get, can get worse and can develop into something called cardiokinase syndrome. That would be more of a, of a medical emergency, but it's something, something to be watched and something that we can treat. Last general category we want to talk about is, is vertebral compression fracture. And what this is, is an actual fracture of that vertebral body. You can see uh, that, gets, that gets fractured. Typically, that's as a result of trauma or as we age, uh, osteoporosis, either uh, idiopathic or from chronic steroid use. It can result from metastatic cancer. Typically, what you would present with this is acute, severe pain in the central spine, typically after some type of, of trauma. This can progress to, to weakness or numbness if those, those fragments of bone are pushing posteriorly and compressing nerve roots, similar to a disc would do. What, what I wanna emphasize is that there's, we talked about overlap and th there is a lot of overlap in terms of pain management. It's my job to differentiate what, what contributions are coming from the spine, what are coming from other areas, such as the sacroiliac joint or the hip. So when you come in uh, for evaluation, you can expect a thorough history and physical evaluation. In terms of history, we're looking at location of pain, how long has it been going on? How severe is it? Is it really impacting your life? Is it impacting the, your functional status? Is there any neurologic dysfunction? Have, have symptoms gotten worse, gotten better? And any previous treatments that, you, that you've had, including injections. If for the most part, if you've been treated by a, a different physician or in the past, and an injection worked for you, we're gonna move closer towards that, to that treatment option um, and vice versa, if something hasn't worked for you, it generally wouldn't, wouldn't want to repeat that unless something's changed with your history. In addition to those general, those general considerations, I want to rule out um, severe things, infections, cancer, fractures, or, or severe neurologic dysfunction. By doing that, we, you, we take this, ex, I take an exclusionary history, look for red flag symptoms. Those are typically unintentional weight loss, night pain, fever, night sweats, or, or that severe neurologic dysfunction. Bowel and bladder dysfunction is one of those things. If there's severe compression in the lumbar spine, you can develop symptoms like that. And that, as I said earlier, is, is an emergency where we would, we would want to get you to a, a surgical evaluation quicker. In terms of physical evaluation, we combine that history with physical evaluation. If you talk about numbness, tingling, weakness, I'm going to do a thorough neurological exam to help, help see the extent of that and help tease out exactly where I think that nerve root's being compressed. Musculoskeletal exam, we're looking for general range of motion. In, in inspection, looking if there's any lesions on the skin, palpation, if there's any sore points and provocative maneuvers. I try and facilitate, help me tease out exactly where your pain's um, coming from. You can do maneuvers to induce some, some discomfort if the facets are causing your pain, straight leg raise for a nerve root, or Faber exams looking for sacroiliac joint pain primarily. Generally, there's not um, a lot of lab work involved in the, in the workup. There are certain indications where we may order, I may order um, CBC, ESR, CIP, CRP. These are inflammatory markers if we're looking for certain, certain inflammatory condition, conditions such as um, autoimmune deficiency, rheumatoid arthritis, things like that. Imaging is very important in the workup. Typically, um, we'll start out with some x-rays. This allows me to evaluate the bony anatomy, some of those things I was pointing out earlier, seeing if there's any degenerative changes, osteoarthritis, whether the disc space are narrowed. The next step tends to be an MRI. This will allow me to better look at the soft tissue. X-rays are great at looking at bone, but they can't see the discs and the nerve roots. MRI allows us to better evaluate that see the extent of any nerve root compression or, or disc herniations. CAT scan is sometimes used. It's great at looking at bone, 
It can look at soft tissue better than x-rays, but not as good as MRI. But sometimes there are situations where, where it's the faster um, study or there's a contraindication to get, to get an MRI if someone has metal in their body, um, pacemaker, et cetera. Now we're getting in treatment options. So you can see there's a lot of different treatment options here. And, and a phrase you'll hear in the pain management world is multimodal treatment strategy. And that's what I really wanna emphasize. It's not just one treatment, one injection, one medication, one, one modification that's gonna help improve your pain. We try to approach it, I try to approach it in a, in a multimodal, all encompassing treatment plan. And that includes activity modifications, lifestyle modifications, bracing in some instances, although I'm not a huge proponent of back brace. Medications, ice, heat, physical therapy, uh, more manual therapy, acupuncture, and then pain management. Pain management, pain injections, things that I can offer you, specific, specific procedures that can dramatically improve um, your pain symptoms. So just going into each of these, each of these treatments, um, in a little bit more detail, lifestyle modifications. We mentioned those risk factors. So maintaining healthy healthy weight, uh, working towards optimal weight, stop smoking, and maintaining a, a healthy, healthy uh, exercise routine, non-impact, low-impact aerobic exercise, and making sure you lift things correctly. Don't, don't uh, ergonomic, ergonomic um, technique is important in preventing back pain and preventing injuries. Physical therapy is another option um, where you can get directed uh, education and directed treatment. The emphasis here is usually on core strengthening, abdominal muscles, back muscles, and flexibility. And those, those two treatment options are, are active treatments. These are where the patient's involved, you're involved in your own care, you're, you're doing active things to prevent your pain. But sometimes... Um, that's not enough, and we need to move into more passive treatments where, where we're offering treatments that you can't necessarily do for yourself, massage therapy, chiropractic treatment, TENS unit, acupuncture, um, things along those lines. If those things, those things aren't working, those are typically the things that have been tried prior to um, people reaching my clinic, although I will, I will often prescribe those if those haven't been done. And we get into the medication options. Medications, it's important to note, are a temporary solution. We don't, we don't intend, I don't intend on having you take those medications long term if you don't have to. The purpose is to increase function and productivity while we employ that multimodal treatment strategy and, and improve your, your symptoms. Some of the medications that are commonly used non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These are your, your Motrin, your Naproxen, Mobic, Celebrex. They're effective medications. Often I think they're, they're the most effective medications by reducing inflammation. They can uh, improve, improve your pain. <clears throat> there are uh, some considerations. If you had kidney problems or problems with uh, stomach ulcers, we, we might uh, limit those, those prescriptions because they can cause issues. And with long-term use, there's a risk of uh, stroke and heart attack. Um, but again, this is with prolonged use. That's, that's with, with years of use. But with any medications, we try to do the lowest dose for the shortest duration of time. Tylenol is a great over-the-counter medication. Um, it can reduce pain. It reduces pain in a different mechanism than the NSAIDs, and you can use those together. Big drawback to Tylenol is kind of a weaker um, analgesic and it can cause liver disease in high doses. Muscle relaxers are another medication category that's commonly employed. They start to treat more of that myofascial pain, that muscle spasm, uh, which is can be a symptom on its own or as part of a, a more complex pain situation. The, the big drawback to these medications are they tend to cause sedation. This can sometimes be beneficial if someone's having trouble sleeping, um, but typically is a, a limitation of these medications. You can't, people aren't comfortable taking them during the day. 
Um, I mentioned val Valium here just because that is that is a medication that's commonly used or has been used in the past. I generally don't use it for muscle spasm, but just because of the high uh, addiction potential, but you may see this um, or have been prescribed this in the past. Another medication category or AEDs or anti-epileptic medications, gabapentin and pregabalin are the most common we use. And these, these we use for nerve pain. If you're getting that radicular pain, that radiculopathy, um, these medications can help calm down that nerve, that nerve, that nerve irritation, that burning pain. Side effects, sedation, and with gabapentin in particular, you have to take it three times a day. So it's a little bit cumbersome to take, but the side effects can sometimes be limiting. So we'll start out with a low dose and slowly ramp up to effect. Often I'll have patients that say, I've tried gabapentin, it hasn't worked for me in the past. And that's typically because you didn't reach the, 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 the effective dose. Um, if you don't get to that, effective dose can be up to 600 milligrams uh, three times a day is, is typically the, the effective dose. And often people won't reach that. Sometimes it's because of side effects and we're not gonna have you, I'm not gonna have you take a medication if you don't tolerate it. But if you can tolerate it, reaching that therapeutic dose can often be very effective and reducing that type of pain. Not generally first line, but in the, in the antidepressant category, we have trisogic antidepressants and uh, SNRIs or serotonin, norepinephrine, reuptake inhibitors. Now these medications, although they're in the antidepressant category, I'm not using them for depression, I'm using them for pain. Anything that increases that norepinephrine can help reduce the transmission of pain at the level of the spinal cord. So that's where these medications are employed. They're not a, I take this medication and pain reduced immediately. It's the type of medication where you've been on for a few weeks, to a month and you start to see an overall reduction in your pain. Tricyclic antidepressants tend to be a little sedating, so I may use that at night if someone's having trouble sleeping. If that's not an issue, we may move to more of the Cymbalta or the Effexor type medication. And this wouldn't be a pain management talk if we didn't talk about opioids. Um, okay in the short term. Long-term opiates are not a good option. Uh, the high abuse, high addiction potential, side effects, and everyone knows about uh, opiate epidemic, overdose risk, especially with mixed with, with other substances such as that benzodiazepines, alcohol, or illicit drugs. But in the short term, they can be very effective. Someone comes in in extreme pain due to do an injury or nerve root, a short dose of opiates can be very effective. It can help be a temporizing measure while we, while we develop some of those other treatment strategies. So now moving on, on the, the interventional treatments, the injections that I can offer you. These are things that I do on a day-to-day -day basis that can help really reduce your pain significantly. Epidural steroid injection is one of the most common. We would use this for people that had lumbar radiculopathy or spinal stenosis. When we're doing an epidural steroid injection, so we're accessing the epidural space. That's a space in the spinal column. The spinal cord is surrounded by fluid and then a, and a fibrous sheath called the dura. Right outside that dura is the epidural space and that's the space that we're accessing. It has nerve roots that are exiting the spinal column. So by injecting cortisone into that space, we can reduce inflammation, bathe those, those nerve roots in, in uh, some calming medication that can reduce the, that irritation. So we talked about the different approaches and here you just see those access. This is the interlaminar approach, similar to a labor epidural in this interlaminar window. This is good for midline, midline pain or bilateral, bilateral pain. This is the transferal approach you see accessing through the, the keyholes here. And this is delivering medicine specifically along a nerve root and specifically near where those, where those disc herniations are occurring. And this is generally what I would employ for someone that has unilateral pain, pain on one side to give the most effective results. 
And then finally, we have the caudal approach, accessing the epidural space from a lower point at the lower portion of the sacrum. This is good for bilateral pain in someone where maybe they've had surgery in their lumbar spine. So the anatomy is disrupted. And I wouldn't want to put a needle through that area. We would access it through the caudal approach and give, give similar results. Here you see just examples of those. These are live x-ray machine, uh, live x-ray images called fluoroscopy. This is what I use in the procedure suite to help guide my injections. This is a transframal approach. And you can see the contrast that I'm injecting. One thing to note is when we're doing these injections, I use contrast. So I get the needle in the location where I want and inject some material that lights up under live x-ray. So I can see exactly where that medicine is going to go. And at that point, then I inject the therapeutic solution. Uh, that way we can ensure that it's, it's going where we want. And you're going to get the most effective results. This is the caudal approach here in the middle. And you can see accessing, accessing the uh, epidural space. And you can see the contrast traveling up that epidural, epidural column. This is our classic Christmas tree pattern. This is the epidural space and the contrast leaking out some of the nerve roots as it's traveling up that space. And then the interlaminar approach. These are the images that we see in fluoro. Generally very well tolerated. These are simple procedures, uh, but there are some adverse events. Uh, most commonly soreness at the injection site, some temporary increase in pain. If those nerve roots are very uh, irritated or there's really tight compression, just the injecting volume into that space can, can lead to some increased pain, but it's normally temporary. And typically people will, will walk out of that injection feeling better because I do add some local anesthetic to it. Spinal headache is, is an uncommon complication, but it does happen if we puncture that dura that I, that I talked about, but very unlikely, especially with the use of, of uh, fluoroscopy. From the steroid, you can get flushing, increased blood sugar, possibly some anxiety or sleep disturbance. And more uncommon, more severe adverse events that we worry about are infection and bleeding. We use very sterile technique, stop any sort of blood thinners before we do these injections, and use careful, careful technique to, to avoid those. But in terms of catastrophic nerve injury, we're talking in the range of one in 50,000, one in 100,000. So very unlikely for any, anything like that to occur. Steroids are potent anti-inflammatory medications. That's why we're putting that medication into the epidural space. But with repeat dose, there can be some side effects, weight gain, osteoporosis, suppression of your body's own cortisone production from suppressing the adrenal, adrenal gland. Um, so we try to minim minimize the injections uh, to the least amount. Um, you, can, you can get up to three injections in a six month period. I tend to don't need to use that many. Sometimes we would, but we try to, try to go with the lowest dose that we can. So we talked about the facet joints being a source of pain. So the treatment that I, I in terms of interventional options for, for facet joints is a medial branch block. And so you see here on the right, you can see as the nerve roots exit through these foramen, there's a branch called the medial branch that innervates that facet joint. So this facet joint, for example, is caught by the medial branch above and the medial branch below. So in order to reduce pain, I will inject a local anesthetic solution on this medial branch to numb up that facet joint. This is primarily a diagnostic test to see if indeed the, the facet joints are causing your pain. Now I will add steroid, which typically can give an extended duration up to three months. Um, and that, that may be enough, but the diagnostic portion is important because if that injection doesn't last long enough, there's a follow-up procedure we can do um, called RFA, which I'll get into in just, in just a minute. So this is what it looks like to do the uh, medial branch block. You can see we use, we use the bony landmarks that I can't see the nerve root, but I know it's running in this groove between the transverse process and superior superior articulating process in this groove. That's where the medial branch runs. So we, we do the injections there. Typically we'll do three, three injections to catch two facet joints. Um, and this is what it looks like. Usually I won't do six needles in this picture. I'll do three 
and then place three in the other side. So I mentioned if those injections aren't lasting long enough, if they don't up to three months, but let's say it produced dramatic pain reduction, 80% pain reduction, but only for, for a few days or a few weeks. If that happens twice, we can move to something called radiofrequency ablation, where instead of numbing up those joints, I provide some heat to those, those nerve roots to burn them away for a period of time. And that can give you up to six to 12 months. Generally, in my experience, closer to 12 months worth of pain relief, sometimes more. It's important to note, this is a minimally invasive procedure. It sounds a little intimidating, burning, burning the nerves away, but it's, it's very similar to the medial branch block. Once we get the needles in position, it's only a 90 second treatment. It's a little bit more uncomfortable than the medial branch. You may have a little bit of, little bit of pain afterwards, up to two weeks. Typically, it's more on the, the time frame of three to four days, maybe a little bit increased soreness. And sometimes you can get some burning sensation, sunburn sensation overlying the skin as those nerves are, uh, are irritated after the, after the procedure. Here you can see the, the diagram. On the right fluoroscopy, you see the needles are in very similar locations with the medial branch blocks. Um, we lie them down in a parallel location, parallel to the bony landmarks. And that's because the, the burn tends to be in this football-shaped elliptical pattern. So if we lie it down in that parallel, parallel position, we can get a larger burn area, and more effective treatment. The last treatment uh, option that I want to talk about is a kyphoplasty. This is for someone who would present with an acute uh, vertebral compression fracture. Uh, one of the ways we can uh, stabilize that fracture and reduce pain from that is what's called a kyphoplasty. And with a kyphoplasty, what we're doing is I'm inserting a trocar into that vertebral body inflating a balloon to provide a cavity for, for cement. And then we inject uh, surgical cement into that space to stabilize that fracture, um, provide immediate pain relief and prevent any further collapse from that, from that injury. And lastly, I'm not a surgeon. I will, I will be doing a surgery, but often uh, surgery is indicated typically as a last option after we failed other conservative measures, physical therapy, lifestyle modifications, and medi medications, a series of injections, or in more urgent situations where there's profound neurologic deficit, where we do see some of those red flags, I'm worried about cancer, worried about infection, we may refer you to, to one of our colleagues that can, that can get that uh, better treated. If the pain is, is severe, disabling, again, not responding to other treatments, well, that we may, that's where we may move to those, those type of surgical referrals. So that is um, my talk. I will open up to questions now. Please uh, feel free to ask me. I'll try to give you my best answer. Yes, you, you absolutely can come and get a different injection. Also, often, as I talked about, there can be multiple etiologies going on. You had some medial, you had some facet joint pain. We did the ablation that resolved that axillary pain, but maybe there's something else going on. Maybe you have some sacroiliac joint pain or some discogenic pain, and we, we, can, we can treat those accordingly. Generally, um, it has to be at least at least two weeks um, before before um, interventional treatments, but I would I would generally like it to be a little bit longer than that, more the more the four to six week time frame. Restless leg syndrome is independent. It's it's different than spinal stenosis. There may be some overlap in symptoms, but it's its own etiology that generally doesn't have a, a anatomic, anatomic uh, etiology.
Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and that's my job. When you come in by physical exam, putting you some of those provocative maneuvers or maybe even some diagnostic injections to tease out exactly what symptom is coming from what source. Um, there are often overlaps. Sometimes you may have both lower back issues and hip issues, but, but we, we can figure that out with a series of evaluations and injections. Usually, usually it depends on the degree of, of severity, how severe those, those, those neurologic deficits are and how long they've been present. If we catch them early, which is why we're looking for those things, um, generally, if we get those, that area decompressed, you should regain some of that function. On the other hand, if it's been there for an extended period of time, it's a very, very profound deficit, um, there's a chance that some of that, some of that, there may be some degree of permanency, but you should always regain some, some function if we're, if we're catching that. Well, that would really depend on the evaluation, your history, what your imaging looked like. Um, just to say you've tried those things, it's not always a, a cookbook algorithm. Would have to really evaluate and see exactly what's going on to help to help determine what what uh, area I wanted to target next. There is certainly a lot of overlap in terms of the, the sources of pain in the lumbar and cervical, cervical spine. A lot of the treatments do, do overlap, facet joint pain, irritation uh, to the nerve roots, stenosis, those are all etiologies. So there is a lot of overlap, although there are some individual things in each area that, that you, you would want to uh, try to differentiate with. I'm not opposed to any of, any of the, the, again, the active treatments, things that you can do for yourself. I think those are all good, good uh, techniques to provide benefit if you can. There can be some, some benefit from decompression by that inversion table. Um, certainly if it's causing you discomfort, um, I, I would shy away from it, but, uh, but I'm not opposed to that providing it's not causing any sort of uh, discomfort to you. Absolutely, absolutely. The technique is a little bit different. Um, they're not called medial branches in the, in the sacroiliac joint, they're called lateral branches, but, but yes, we can, we can do a RFA, radio frequency ablation in the sacroiliac joint, which often gives great results for, for sacroiliac joint pain. If the pain has not improved with an RFA procedure, that would make me lead to believe that the source is not from the facet joints. There's a different, there's a different source of pain. So I would have to review the images, review the physical exam and history, um, and come up with a different, different cause of the pain, and we would we would move towards treating that specific problem. Well, that goes back to the time frame that we talked about. Four to six weeks, usually these conditions will resolve. Mechanical lower back pain, myofascial pain will improve in that four to six week period. You start getting over that six week period, especially over that 12 week period where we come into the chronic pain strategy. That's where I would really advise you to seek further care and, and, and take it to the next, next treatment option. I think spinal cord stimulators are a very effective treatment for certain pain conditions and post-laminectomy syndrome or failed back syndrome is one of those situations where 
um, I've seen very good results with the spinal cord stimulator. Um, the nice thing about spinal cord stimulator is it's it's not something we move to permanent implant. You have a trial period. So we, we will put in that, that trial lead um, for a temporary period to, to make sure that we'll provide benefit before we set you up for a permanent implant. So I think it's something that would I would recommend um, trying in that situation. Well, it depends on what you mean by, by pain relief. If I'm doing an epidural steroid injection, I add local anesthetic to that. So there should typically be, almost in all cases, you'll get some immediate benefit right away. You'll walk out of that office feeling with reduced pain. Now that local anesthetic is only gonna last for a few hours to a day, and it takes a day or two, sometimes up to a week for that anti-inflammatory effect to take effect. So you'll get some immediate benefit, but for the lasting benefit, typically it's, 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 we would give it up to a week before we, before we said that that injection wasn't, wasn't effective. Ice and heat are both effective modalities for reducing pain. Um, in the acute setting, after, after an injection or after an injury, ice is probably the, the uh, option I would, I would recommend. Um, it reduces pain, it can reduce inflammation. And in the more chronic setting, you can start introducing heat to improve, improve circulation, improve flexibility. But yes, those are, those are both great options.